he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well to have those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. We pray. Father, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. Lord, just use your word, not only to, to change our hearts, but to transform us into your image. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. You know, Matthew is by far the most unlikely of all the disciples. When you think about what, what this meant, I mean, he was a tax collector, a, a person who was in a very special category. Now, he's a different type of tax collector than Zacchaeus was, if you know, if you know that. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, uh, which meant he was really, really hated by people. But Matthew was, a, uh, was kind of a toll collector, so he was just really hated by people, actually. And, uh, and this, this call to, to have Matthew come alongside him would have just blown everybody away. They couldn't imagine something like this going on. And, and part of it was like people knew Matthew. And, and like when Jesus called him, what, what, what it meant in essence was, I see in you the potential to become like me. His friends would have looked at him and go, really? I mean, Matthew, the tax collector? Because they, they were this, in this special kind of category called sinners. And all kinds of people were, were clumped there. And Jesus was at kind of the, the top of the social ladder. Rabbi was about as high as you could go in that culture. And, and tax collectors were lumped in this other group of people called sinners. And they were kind of at the bottom of the social rung. And never would these two people hang out. No rabbi before would have ever thought of asking one of those kind of people to be a disciple would just never have happened. In fact, usually the, uh, a potential disciple would ask to be one. And most of the time they heard, no, you don't have what it takes. But here's Jesus going to Matthew and saying, follow me. In other words, I see in you the potential to become like me. Now we're in this series called Living Questionable Lives. And, and, and we're looking at times where, where people questioned Jesus about what he was doing because he, he wasn't doing it the way they expected him to do. And, and we're hoping to live lives that cause other people to ask questions. And things like, why are you so kind to people who aren't kind to you? How come you're so generous with what you have? Why do you love sacrificially in that way? We want people to ask a question because there's an answer to this question. It's about what God is doing in us that overflows out of us into the lives of others. And so we spoke a little bit about that last week. We're continuing this series today. But before we dive into this, I want you to, to, to consider a question here. Which comes first, believing or belonging? Now, here's, here's what we mean. Believing, it, you know, we, we, we come together because we think the same, because we share the same faith. Uh, that, that's believing. Or belonging, or do, do we gather together because we, we like each other and, and then maybe, maybe sort of we figure out what we believe afterwards? So I want you to ask the person next to you, which comes first, believing or belonging? Go ahead and have that discussion.
All right, well, now the discussions have moved well past that question, I'm sure, at this point. So what is it? Is it believing or belonging? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. and, and, you know, actually, the answer to this question, it, it could actually depend on how long you've been in church, too. And, and here, here's part of the reason for that. It, it used to be that everyone would have said believing, that 40 years ago, uh, people would have always said that. And what would happen is, like, if you were living in the Midwest and you, you moved out to Washington uh, and you were part of a Lutheran church or a Baptist church, you would automatically say, well, we're going to go and belong to another Lutheran or Baptist church. It was kind of like Mick Church. You just kind of do it one place, you do it in another. And you just, you believe the same. But today, it's very different. In fact, um, a lot of times people are invited in and they, they see something that they like in people um, that they, maybe they see that the love and the joy and the peace, other fruits of the Spirit in your life, and there's something about that that attracts that to them, and they know that you have faith, but they're not sure they've got it all figured out. And sometimes they just say, I want to be part of that even before I know exactly what that is, even though I know exactly what we believe. And, and so there, there's been kind of a shift in how it works more and more in our culture. But mainly I asked you that because it was kind of a trick question, and I do that to you. So... But, but this is important because uh, Jesus had a way of including people. He was just a master at this. When he called Matthew, that tax collector, uh, it, it, just, it was kind of scandalous when he did that. Nobody saw this coming. It, it, was, it, it would have just it blew all kinds of people away, raised some questions as he did it. Uh, but not only did he call him and say, okay, I want you to, to be one of my disciples, then he goes to his house and so if you are uh, you know, a tax collector, you're considered part of the dregs of society, who are your friends? The dregs of society, other tax collectors and sinners, other people in that category. Now, here's the thing about this. It wasn't just that people thought poorly of them. Uh, there were actually some, some laws back in that place that said those people aren't even allowed to go to the temple. Now, we start working that backwards, figuring out what that means for a second. Well, if you couldn't go to the temple for a sacrifice, and if you couldn't act, offer a sacrifice, that, that was how people atoned for their sins and got right with God. And so all of a sudden, you start working those things backwards. You go, these people are essentially, not only do people not like them, but they sort of get this message, God doesn't like you either. You're, you're kind of stuck. You are, you are off here, you're on the outskirts of society, the people don't want you, God really doesn't want you, and here you are. And Jesus does something that no other rabbi would do. He says, I'm going to your house and invite your friends. And he has this amazing way of loving people, accepting people, without necessarily condoning what they do. Because there would have been a lot that was part of those people's lives that Jesus would not have approved of, that it was not in alignment with the Father. And yet at the same time, there was something about him that was able to separate that, the things that were wrong, the things that were broken, from who they were as a person. And, and it was just Jesus' way of doing that that just drew people to him. No one else before had shown that kind of interest. No, no man of God had ever done anything like that before. And here was Jesus with this interest in them, even willing to teach them and say, you know, God even loves you. He knows all about you. He knows all about your past. And he still has an interest in you. What an amazing thing that was. And, and what, what happened, though, of course, here, is that not everybody thought this was a good idea. The Pharisees said that you can't do that, Jesus. Right? This, is, this is not what you're supposed to do. And so instead of asking him, they ask his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Right? And remember, we said this is where they say, Jesus, you're doing it wrong again. <laughs> you do it wrong all the time. This is another example, Jesus. They're not supposed to do this. Some of that sinner might run, rub off on you. It might go through osmosis or something like that. You can't be hanging out with these people. You're doing it wrong. And Jesus comes back with just an amazing line. I, I, love, I love what he says here. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I, I came not to call righteous, but sinners. 
And so those Pharisees, in their mind, what they had going on was that, okay, there are, there's us, and then there's sinners, like, way down here. And, and, and we, we're just t- two in two totally different categories. We, we don't even relate to those people. Jesus, you know, you want to be up here with us, so don't go down here with them. I mean, that, that's kind of the idea. We're, we're, we're in entirely different places. But, you know, the Pharisees were, were measuring on a scale that, that they devised. It was one that was in, invented by human beings. But it looks very different than God's scale. You see, God's scale looks something like this. He's up here, and he's holy, and there's people down here in the muck. And you might be here, or you might be here, <laughs> but you're in the muck. You might be on the top level of the muck, or the middle level of the muck, or maybe towards the bottom of the muck, but you're in the muck. I mean, that, that's, that's, what, that's what the Bible tells us. And, and so Jesus has this whole different perspective. He empties himself. He puts, sets all that stuff aside and says, I'm entering in here with you. Now, he, he's not part of it, but he enters into it. And, and, it, and it, it's this whole different perspective that he has. And, and the Pharisees, you know, when, when Jesus is saying like, oh yeah, it's only the healthy who need a doctor, not the, you know, or the, pardon me, the only the sick that need a doctor, not the, not the healthy, they're probably going, oh, that's why you're for other people, Jesus. Yeah, we, we're, you know, up here. And Jesus is probably going, mm-mm, <laughs> not even close. Just maybe, maybe a different level of the muck. Maybe that's all it is. And the amazing thing about Jesus with this is that, that he, he has this way of, of loving people where they are and loving them. And, and the thing that when it translates to you and to me what this means is that we really can't stand in judgment of other people, can we? I mean, if, if, if we think we're like the Pharisees and there's other people down here in the muck, we try to stand in judgment of other people. But when we take the view that God has, it says, holiness is up here and, and maybe you're only in one different level of the muck, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit for us to stand in judgment of other people. We're not calling it not muck. We're not calling it not sin. That, that's not what we're saying. We're calling it what it is. But we're, we're really in no different place from one another. That we all have the same fundamental problem it just has some different symptoms when it comes out of us. It looks a little bit differently on the outside, but in the core, it's all the same problem. And this is what Jesus came to deal with. Now, in this series, we're, we're talking about a couple of habits. They're, they're habits of missional people. And, and what that means is people that, that want to live lives with, with the mission of Jesus in mind. And last week we talked about blessed, that this was taking what God had placed in your hands, whatever that was, if it was, it was a skill or a resource or even offering a prayer or encouragement to people, and just saying, how do we bless them? That's one of the things that begins to send us on mission. Today we're talking about my favorite habit, which is eating. And, and we'll talk more about what we mean by that in just a second. And in the upcoming weeks, we'll hit <clears throat> listen, learn, and send. So... Let's talk about eating for just a second. When we, when we talk about eating with people, it's really about more than the act of eating. Now, we know we need food to, to live, and, and sometimes we, we, we eat on the run. Sometimes we eat stuff we shouldn't eat, right? We, we all know all about the eating part of this. But what we're talking about with eating here is, is the stuff that goes around eating. You see... Eating provides the context, at least eating at a table, it provides the context for relationship. It provides the context for unhurried conversation. And that's really what we're getting at. So it could happen over coffee, it could happen in some other way too, but what we're really getting at is what oftentimes happens when you gather people around a dinner table and, and you sit and as you're eating, you talk and you talk about life, and you talk about issues, and, and oftentimes you talk about faith, other things that just kind of come up in the course of unhurried conversation. This is what we're speaking of. And, and, and there's something valuable to us in this, especially when we do it with people who don't share our faith, with people who are kind of on the outside. And we'll, we'll circle back around to what this looks like at, at the end of the sermon. So it, it's a, eating is really not so much about the nourishment part, but more about what's going on with relationships. 
We also recognize today, especially today, that some forms of community and relationship take intentionality. I remember when I was a kid, uh, what he, the friends I had were usually kind of whoever was put in front of me. You know, like, you know, whoever mom or dad made a play date with or whoever you went to school with or the neighbors, right? Weren't those people usually your friends when you were a kid? And, and even today, there are some relationships that happen because you work with people or you live next to them uh, and whether or not that's a good thing, you know, may, you may or may not be the case, but you, you're, you're kind of put into relationships with some people. But there's another aspect of relationship that we can choose to have. We can choose to pursue or not to pursue. And, and that's what we want to talk about for just a second because um, a relationship today, it seems to take more intentionality than maybe it has in years past. And part of that is uh, we live in a culture that's more electronically connected than ever before. We've got more ways to communicate than we ever had, ever had before. But we're also in a culture that's lonelier than it's ever been before. And you go, isn't that weird how that works? But somehow, all these different means of communicating have not actually fulfilled what needs to happen in terms of of how God God designed us to work in relationship. It it doesn't actually meet all those needs. And in addition to giving us more options, it's actually made us worse at some of the in-person stuff that used to be more natural, um, some of the younger generations are, are, are just lacking in some of the skills uh, that just used to be common because there was no other way we had to do it. Right? We, we didn't have any other choice but to actually go and talk to people face-to-face. And, and so we find people are actually getting worse at this over time and actually meeting people, building new relationships. And so in some ways it takes some more intentionality on our part to be able to do something with that. But there's something about inviting people in, about being intentional, about looking for the person who's lonely, the person who's on the outside, and saying, I value you enough to invite you in. I value you enough to to invite you to my home, to invite you into what I'm doing, to, to not just let you stand there by yourself. That's part of what we mean by intentionality here. Uh, A word that the Bible uses for this is hospitality, and it comes up multiple times. Uh, Let's read this verse together. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. All right, let's talk about hospitality for just a moment. Now, it can take multiple forms. And maybe one of the most common times we think of is, is, all right, when we have people in our house, we, we have people over every Sunday evening and that we, we get to enjoy and have dinner with. They're part of our life group. We, we study with them. And, and for, for us, they're kind of like an extended family uh, for, for us. And it, it's a great thing. And when we have dinner, there's just unhurried conversation around the table. It's, it's, it's a really neat thing. Uh, and especially for, for a lot of us that don't have extended family around, it's, it's a great way to have those relationships and, and do life together. But, but hospitality is more than that. If you happen to be here last week and heard that testimony of one of our musicians talking about a lady who had welcomed her in the first time she came back to church after being away from God for years and years, and how important that was that she welcomed her in, um, you know, it, it wasn't that this was this lady's house, right? She, I mean, she almost lives here, but, but anyway, uh, it's... Uh, it wasn't her house, but yet she felt free to say, welcome. But, you know, I, we don't want to see you standing alone. We want to invite you into something. It's another form of hospitality to not let the person who's on the outside, the person who doesn't know anybody else, or the person who may be in pain, to just not just let them sit there, but invite them in. And sometimes we go, well, shouldn't they just take initiative themselves? Some of us are wired that way. A lot of us aren't. And a lot of us need someone to just just invite us in, to make us feel welcome. One of the things we know about people that attend church in North America, especially when they visit for the first time, is is if if they're not here uh, because a friend invited them or because uh, they're like brand new to the area and just kind of checking out churches, most likely there's something tough going on in their life. And maybe they've been away from church for a while or something like that, but there's something tough going on and, and they need someone 
who cares. They want to know that there's a God who loves them, and they wonder, do his people actually care? Do his people actually want to love them? And, and this is important for us to recognize because there's two different ways that we can show up when we gather as the body of Christ. What, what, is, what most people do is we kind of show up waiting to be fed and, and waiting to worship and, and, and waiting to experience you know, God doing things in us. And, and that's not a bad expectation. Those are good things and we want to do that. But I want to invite you into something more. You see, what we could do without having to come any earlier or stay any later is show up with an expectation that we're not only here to receive, but we can also be here to minister. That, that when we see someone who's standing on the outside or not included, we can actually invite them in. We can go and introduce ourselves. We can, uh, and, and even if they have a question we can't answer, a lot of us have at least figured out how to, how to go get the answer to the question. We can connect them with the right people. And, and you, know what, you, know what, you know what you'd be doing if, if you did that? If we just had our, our, our heads up and our eyes open, you would actually be ministering to people. You would show up and you would be on mission. And, and I feel the tension that you probably do too about, about seeing people that I know and, and, and want to catch up with because we like them and, and that's a good thing. It really is to have, have people that go to church that you actually like. That's not a bad thing at all. But, but there's also people on the outside and you have a chance to minister to them by simply inviting them, by simply saying hi, getting to know a name, maybe even inviting them to something else. And, and what, what a great way to practice hospitality. What a great type of ministry that we can all do. You know, I, I love what, uh, what the author of Hebrews says here. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. You never know who it might be, right? Here's the last thing I want to leave you with. We can create environments that foster relationships and gospel-centered conversation. That there's things you can do that actually make it more likely to build relationships and to have conversations that point to Jesus. One of those simple things happens around a dinner table. Probably five years ago, there was a, a guy that, that came into my life and he was in his late 20s and, and just had grown up in, in a broken home. And he, he came over to our house for, for dinner one time and he commented that this was the first time in his life he'd ever actually sat at, a, at like a family dinner at a table before. And I said, huh, hadn't ever thought about that before. Because it had always been part of my context and it just seemed kind of ordinary and boring and normal and what, you know, just kind of what I thought everybody did. And, and he went out and explained how much this means to him. I mean, like, and what, what I learned was that he didn't even have an idea of what it looked like. He didn't even know, like, like, how do people interact when they sit across the table? What kinds of things do you actually talk about you know, around a table? It was all a brand new experience. And since then, I, I've met a number of other people that kind of had similar experiences that have, have been around us. I, I bring this up to you. Because for those of you that that's just a normal thing and you go, why would we want to invite anybody over to that? We have really boring conversations around our dinner table. That might be, but what you can also do is give people a new vision of what life can be like. Let me share with you. You see, if you've never experienced something like that, you might not even know what's possible. If you've never actually witnessed conversation like that, if you've never even witnessed people even resolve a conflict or, or, or other things, the conversations that can happen around the normal course of, of a dinner at a table, um, you might not even be able to imagine what it looks like to do that in a healthy way. And those of us that, that have somewhat functioning families and, and actually would say, hey, we could invite people into that, there's this amazing opportunity for people that, that have never experienced something like that to experience what it means to just have those, those unhurried times of conversation where you talk about life 
and you talk about faith and how God intersects in those things, it's not something you ever force. It just kind of can seem to come up in the course of a conversation. And, and who would have thought that you could go on mission by eating, right? I mean, who would have thought that that was the case? But by sitting down, having dinner, especially when, when we invite people in that don't share our faith, that's one of those ways that we can just build relationship and go on mission. And it just reminds me of these words of Paul when he writes this. Would you read it with me? Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul shared with him not only the gospel, what's what he was known for, but he did it in a relational way. He, he really loved those people. So Matthew, he's one of the only two disciples that actually wrote a gospel. The most unlikely of all the disciples to probably be a disciple. And and what's really interesting about Matthew's gospel is the kind of things he includes. Even in the introduction, even in the birth narrative of Jesus, he does something that, that no one else would do. I mean, first of all, he includes women in the birth narrative, just not something you did 2,000 years ago. And the women that he includes are colorful. There's a prostitute, one who committed adultery with a king, a foreigner, a non-Jewish woman, and a woman who was impregnated by by sleeping with her father-in-law. Those are the four women he chooses to include in this, this, this thing. And so it, it's kind of like Matthew, not, not only is he just kind of slipping them in, it's like he's got this yellow highlighter. <laughs> look at this, look at this, look at this. These are all part of the lineage of Jesus. Why would Matthew do something like that? Because he was a guy that experienced the transforming grace of Jesus because he knew better than anybody else what it meant to be part of the dregs of society, to have people that have rejected him, to have people that thought that he was far from God, had no chance, and I'm sure he probably thought that himself. And he had Jesus that came to him and said, I want you to follow me. I see in you the potential to be like me. And it transformed Matthew's life. He does that to us as well. There's that call to each one of us where Jesus says, I know your past. I know your issues that are going on right now. And yet, I still see in you the potential to be like me. That's what we want to do. That's what it means to be his disciples. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for love. We thank you for acceptance and grace for not being afraid to enter into the muck and the mire of this world. And Lord, we thank you that you give us love and mercy. Father, we pray that that just as we have experienced that, Lord, we would be quick to extend that to others, that we wouldn't overestimate our own place, but understand just where we are, that we have received mercy and grace, and it's needed just as much as anyone else. Father, we thank you that you're a God who is not only powerful, but a God who cares, a God who invites us to come to you as beloved children. Lord, so we we do that. We come to you on behalf of ourselves and people we know and love and in our community. Lord, would you be with those who are mourning right now? Would you give them peace and strength that come from beyond the moment? Father, we pray that you would just send your Holy Spirit to walk with them And Lord, that that your people, um, Lord, would just have wisdom as they seek to love them in tangible ways. Father, for those that are experiencing illness and brokenness in their bodies, we pray that that you would enter into that, that you would give them healing according to your will. Father, um, just you as the great physician, know what's needed. Lord, we pray for for brokenness in relationships. We pray for the brokenhearted, first of all. Lord, that you would heal them and give them a peace that only you can give. And Lord, when there's something wrong that that we have a part in, Lord, give us the willingness to 
to make amends, to ask for forgiveness and to extend it as well. Father, we pray for our leaders, uh, those of our country right now. We pray for uh, wisdom as they seek to guide us. We they pray for even the ability to figure things out and work together. Lord, we pray for our community as well, that, that Lord, that you would just put your hand of blessing on it, that you would bring things that are good and right and pure and lovely and that just bring life. And that would be more and more a part of what happens uh, in, in our community. And Lord, that it would come through us. And Father, we pray for ourselves too. We pray that, that we would be filled with your love, that we would have such an amazing experience of what it means to have grace and mercy ourselves. Lord, that it just overflows out of us into the lives of others. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We join in the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.